Shalom everyone, welcome to our new weekly Soul of the Parsha class. This week's class is dedicated to the elevation of the souls of the 45 people who died in the tragedy of Lag Ba'omer Thursday night. Some things in life we can't understand, maybe we're not supposed to understand. And what we do know is that now there's a lot of holy souls that for for no reason we can we can uh, grasp have now the same day of passing the same Hilula as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and for many years to come and we, whenever we celebrate the Hilula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai the day of his passing of his soul reuniting with it, with his creator we'll also be celebrating all their souls and already there's a lot of good things coming out of this tragedy with all the heartache of so many broken families. Uh, there's already a lot of mitzvot and chasadim and acts of kindness that are spreading around the Jewish people and in the land of Israel, and which is a, a ten little bit of a sweetening for this horrible event. Um, this week we're going to be reading the last two parashot of the book of Vayikra, Leviticus. So we're finishing the book of Leviticus this week. The last two parashot are called Behar and Bechukotai. This year we're focusing, of course, on the opening segment of each parasha, so we'll be focusing on the opening of the first parasha, which is Behar. And our topic for today is, what is Chabad? And I do not mean the group Chabad, the religious denomination of Chabad, uh, I mean the Kabbalistic structure, model of intellectual understanding, the process of in, in grasping something and fully comprehending it. It's summed up in Kabbalah in the three sefirot that embody the intellectual level of both the world of Atzilut, the world of emanation, which is the, the world of godliness itself, and also of our own souls. Our soul and the world is made up of ten basic elementary forces, or sefirot, and they are divided into the upper three sefirot, or the intellectual sefirot, or the mochin, the intellect, and the lower seven sefirot, also known as the emotive, in, 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 in the sense that they embody the emotions, the emotive sefirot, or in Hebrew, the midot, the attributes of the heart. Over the course of Sefirat Omer, the counting of the Omer, we go very deep into the lower seven sefirot, because the seven weeks correspond to the seven sefirot, and of course each day within each week, corresponds to the same structure of seven sefirot. So we have 49 days, which is the seven lower emotive sefirot inter-included, seven times seven, and we think very deeply about all these attributes and how they intermesh and interact. But then the upper three sefirot, are, they feel a little bit left out, and they're, they're somewhere in the background. We don't think about them so much, we don't talk about them so much. So uh, today we're going to uh, to make 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 it up for them, and we're going to give them some more room, and in a very deep way, of course, as we're moving through Sfirat Omer on our way to the festival of Shavuot, the festival of weeks, the giving of the Torah, the upper three Sefirot, although they don't have their own days or weeks they should be present at all time. They should be hovering above the entire journey, the entire process, because they are the ones that we use, that we uh, utilize in order to make sense of the counting. As we're thinking about what does it mean that now it's the chesed within Yesod, which is, at least here in Israel, we're just going into this day. And thinking about it requires uh, utilizing the intellectual faculties, which are called, of course, wisdom, 
understanding and knowledge. In Hebrew, it's Chochma, Bina, and Da'at, and the acronym is Chabad. So when I ask the question, what is Chabad? I mean, what does it mean? What is the structure of Chochma, Bina, and Da'at? Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. What is it all about? What's the hidden structure? What does it mean? Why three? What differentiates each one from the other? And of course, we want to see all this from the point of view of an element in the parsha, the opening of the parsha, and it's really a, a beautiful chance to go into this. So I said the upper three sefirot need to hover above the counting of the Omer. It's not just that; is that they are in many ways the goal. Um, hang on. I'm just going to say something in Hebrew to the host. Elazar, I don't know if you can hear me, but I see that many people come to the waiting room. In the room, you have to take them out. I can't do that so much in the time that I learn. So I'm going to ask you to take this. So in many ways, the upper three sefirot are the goal, because we are moving towards the giving of the Torah, and the Torah is first and foremost an object of study. And study is conducted with the intellect. And the Torah is the brain of Judaism, of the Jewish people, and of it's, it's the, the divine word. The divine word is embodied in the letters of the Torah. So first and foremost, the Torah is, corresponds to the intellectual level. We, human beings, our hearts, our emotions, are more associated with, We experience more the lower seven sefirot, the emotive sefirot. But when we try to make up our minds about how we should conduct our lives in the world, then we should be looking at the Torah to give us the proper view of things, how to look at things, how to think about things. The Torah is the mochin, the intellect, the head. God, God is giving us a head, so to speak. He's giving us... Uh, uh, a instructions as to how to look at the world, how to think about the world, etc. So it, the Chag Shavuot is, is we've, we've built up this pyramid of the emotions so that we can receive this intellect and then integrate the two. Integrate all the ideas, concepts of the Torah into, our, uh, into the attributes of the heart. So, it's very important to ask, what is Chabad during the counting of the Omer? And that's what we want to do today, as we're nearing Chag HaShavuot. So, how does the parasha open? It opens uh, with a very simple verse, but again, there's an anomaly, or something rare, something surprising, and that, that is the key always to, to opening up a whole, you know, room of, A whole world of questions. So the, the verse is, "Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe Bahar Sinai leemor, the Lord, God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying the following. And what is the following? The following is the mitzvah of Shmita. Shmita is the seventh year, every seven years, there's a special year called Shmita. It's going to be next year, the next Shmita. Shmita is called, The Sabbath of the land. The land also needs a Sabbath, but the land operates on a different time scale. It's not a weekly Sabbath that like we have every seven days, the day of Shabbat, the day of Sabbath. It's the seventh year. It's like people today taking a sabbatical when they teach or they work, they sometimes deserve to get a sabbatical. So the origin of the term sabbatical is of course, The idea of the Shmitot, the Shmita year. Shmita means letting go. That's what it means. Every seven years we let go of the land. We let the land rest. Meaning we don't uh, plow it and we don't seed and we don't, uh, we don't cut the crops. We, we do not harvest. We let the land be. The land also needs to rest. So every seven years there's a special Shmita. Sabbath year, it's not our own Sabbath, it's the land Sabbath. And then every seven cycles of seven years, 
Uh, there's also another special day which is called the Yovel, the Jubilee. That's, of course, the 50th year. That we don't have a counting of, so we don't celebrate and we don't commemorate the Jubilees today in Judaism until uh, the Sanhedrin will be restored and again we can restore the Jubilee. We do observe though the Shemitot and next year as I said is going to be a Shemitah. So this is the, the, the subject of the first segment of the, of the parasha of Behav. But the anomaly, the thing that raises the question is why mention Mount Sinai? And this is the name of the, of the parasha we're talking about. Behar means on the mountain or at the mountain. And, and the verse again says, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. Behar Sinai. Everything was given on Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai was, we, we, we were there, we talked about Mount Sinai at length in the book of Exodus. And now we're finishing the book of Leviticus. And, and now we're focusing on, on the, it's the, the tabernacle and the, and the sacrificial work and the, the service of the tabernacle and the, meeting, the, the tent of meeting, Oil Moed. So why mention, all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, why mention Mount Sinai? Either you mention Mount Sinai at all times, in all verses that God is telling something to Moses, uh, or you don't mention it at all. But why mention it specifically here and now and with connection to Shemitah? So it's a very big question. It's a very famous question. And it's posed also by, it was posed by the rabbis, the sages. It's posed again by Rashi. Uh, we're not going to give all the answers. But we are going to explore something that opens up when this question is uh, is. Uh, is a, the uh, an, an an answer is uh, attempted or or provided or suggested? Um, what happens is is that we have a debate within the Talmud as to what this means, and and the idea says the following. And so first I'll say what Rashi says, and then we'll go deeper into what the Talmud says. So Rashi says. The idea of this verse of putting together Shemitah with oil with the Mount Sinai is the following. Right now we're getting all the details of the Shemitah, and not just the details, but um, it said where is it said? It said in the in the tent of meetings in the Ohel Moed. This is where it's all said. Moses has long since descended from Mount Sinai. And now the tabernacle has been built, and everything that's going on is down here, down, down on earth. It's not in the mountain. But the re-mentioning of the mountain is to tell us that, just as all the details of this mitzvah are given now here in the, in the tent of meetings, so were they all given on Mount Sinai. So just as now you get all the details, you should know, don't think, that the details are a later invention or a later addition. They were all there on Mount Sinai. It doesn't fully answer all the questions because it doesn't explain why specifically the mitzvah of Shemitah was chosen to exemplify or to teach us this lesson. It could have been any other mitzvah that once you give the details and we know that it's told in the Tent of Meetings, and you mentioned the Mount Sinai, then, you, then we're told the same idea. All the details here were given on Mount Sinai. So that it doesn't answer, and I don't think we'll have time to answer it either in our own class. But what we do get out of this is the following. If you go back from Rashi to the Talmud, and you open the source of what Rashi took, and it's also insinuating the, the continuation of, of, of what Rashi says, but we, get, we see that it's, a, it's more complicated than that. We have a an argument, a friendly argument, because there were two friends, between Rabbi Yishmael, and it used to be a good Jewish name, Rabbi Yishmael, the Tana, the sage, and his friend and Chavruta, Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva, in many ways, they're polar opposites. 
uh, but all but again also good friends. So Rabbi Ishmael says the following. He says he, that's not the opinion that Rashi is giving. He says no, no. the The object of the verse is to tell us the opposite. On Mount Sinai, we only got the general outline, the general rules, the klalot, klalot with a kaf. It's like klalim. It's the general, overarching, broad outlines, the the principles. And then, at Ohel Moed, we were given the details. And Rabbi Akiva says no. And that's what we just said from Rashi. Just as all the details were present in the Tent of Meetings, they were present in Mount Sinai. They were, they were first said, everything, both the general outline and the particular details were all given on Mount Sinai, repeated at the Tent of Meetings, and then repeated the third time on the steps of Moab, Arvot Moab. This is far later. This is on the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Dvarim. In Dvarim, uh, Moses himself recounts everything that happened before using his own language, his own words. The Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, somehow came out of his throat. That's what it said about the book of Deuteronomy. But it was him speaking. It wasn't a prophecy. And it wasn't uh, God, God telling him what to say. He said it because that's what he wanted to say, using his own words. But it turned out to be very, very precise, so much so that it's the fifth book of the Torah. So this is all Avot Moav, the steps of Moav, ha- ha- belong to the fifth book. And that's the third time, according to Rabbi Akiva, that all the Torah, all the general rules, and the, and the particulars were all repeated. So what we get from this is a very interesting idea that we don't usually think about, which is that in many ways you can say that the Torah was taught three times over the course of the years in the desert. It was first taught or given on Mount Sinai. Then it was repeated here in the Tent of Meetings, by Oil Mo'ed. And it was repeated the third time by Moses himself, on the Arvot Moav, on the steps of Moav. Three incidents, three chapters, three uh, incidents in which the entire Torah, according to Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, was, was given. Rabbi Ishmael disagrees. He doesn't even mention the steps of Moab. He doesn't talk about Arvot Moav. He's only referring to the first two. And he makes a very to- he made a very absolute dichotomous uh, separation between the two. He says Mount Sinai is just the broad outline, the klalim, and Oil Moed is the details. So this is very interesting. We have three times the Torah was given or 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 repeated, uh, but we have a, a machloket between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva mentions all three. Rabbi Ishmael mentions just the two, the two, and another difference is that Rabbi Ishmael makes a total. Dif- he totally differentiates the two. He doesn't talk about the three. So you know, we can say the following, and we can say that Rabbi Ishmael is a very dichotomous sort of fellow. He thinks in in binary terms. He doesn't refer to the third incident. And when he's talking about the first two incidents, he's, he's, tell, he's, he's describing them as totally separate. On one of them we get the, the broad outline, on the other one we get the details. Rabbi Akiva is not so binary, and we see this in the same two ways. He does mention the third incident, which is Arvot Moav, and when referring to the first two, he inter-includes them. He says both had the general rules and the particulars, both of them. So this is very interesting. So Rabbi Ishmael again, Rabbi Ishmael is, is thinking in binary terms, in dichotomies, and Rabbi Akiva in two ways is thinking in what we can call non-binary or more integrative terms. He mentions the third time, the third is always like an integration, and he talks about the first two in inter-inclusion terms, as both including the element of the other. 
So this is interesting to think about. Another interesting thing that we should say is that Rabbi Ishmael, in many ways, is uh, a paradigm of a tzaddik, a righteous man. A tzaddik is, the, is someone who is coming from above to below, from what ought to be to what is. That's a tzaddik. A tzaddik, a tzaddik starting point is what ought to be because he's so rectified. And then he goes into reality, into what is, and tries to rectify it also. But Rabbi Akiva, who is the son of converts, who until he was 40 didn't even know how to read, he is a Baal Tshuva. A Baal Tshuva is someone who goes from below to above. He starts with what is, and what is was that he was an illiterate shepherd. And then he gradually ascends to what ought to be. And he learns story and becomes a great teacher. So it's it's that's also interesting to add to the mix. That the the one thinking in binary terms is the same one who is more righteous, that is who is coming from above to below, and the one who's more integrative, or is looking for a, something beyond the the binary, who is into into inclusion, is into finding a third, mentioning the third incident of the giving of the Torah. He is the one coming from below. So. How do we make sense of all of this? So the idea is that the three incidents of the giving of the Torah correspond to the three intellectual sefirot in Kabbalah, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. That is, Mount Sinai was a wisdom-like giving of the Torah, Chokhmah. The re- repetition of it on uh, the Tent of Meetings it was the understanding-like, or the giving of the Torah in terms of understanding of Bina. And finally, the third repetition, which is given in the book of Dvarim by Moses on the steps of Moab, was the knowledge-like, or the knowledge-type giving of the Torah, that. So we can use these three elements to understanding these three sefirot. That's an interesting way of going about it. It's an, it's an it's not the way you would think, or it's not, we're not, it's, you don't see this every day. So it's, it, it's interesting to look at this. So let's just start with what we, we are told by Rabbi Ishmael, right? He was the righteous one. He's going from above to below. So let's start with him. He doesn't mention the steps of Moab, so he's not going into that. We can talk about Chokhmah and Bina without that. That's our first lesson. Although Chokhmah, Bina, and Dat form a triad, we can let go of that for a while. Rabbi Ishmael doesn't talk about the Arvot Moav. And just talk about the first two. And that's a very important thing to know. Chokhmah and Bina are a pair. Before that knowledge comes along, Chokhmah and Bina, wisdom and understanding, are like a pair, like a couple. And they're in fact likened to a father and a mother. Chokhmah is masculine and paternal in nature, and Bina is feminine and maternal in nature. And we'll see in a minute why. So, you know, just like in families, uh, a fa- when you just have a, a man and a woman, they don't have any children yet, are they not a family? They are a family. They're a family of two. Don't take it away from them. There's something about just having a relationship, even if you, you don't have kids for some reason, or you don't yet have kids. It's not nothing. It's something. It's something that what well, we call kovea bracha le'atzmo. It, it merits a, a, a blessing. It's, it, 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 has, it, it stands in its own right. So that is like the child, knowledge. That's the third element. So that is not entering the picture yet, because right now we're, in, we're going with Rabbi Ishmael, who's just talking about Mount Sinai and the Tent of Meetings, Chokhmah and Bina, and he says that's what we need to mention. So that's the first thing that they're a couple, in many ways, rationality, the intellect, is based just on Chokhmah and Bina. And that is something else, something strange. It's a little bit of an outsider in the intellectual realm. So, what does Rabbi Ishmael tell us about these two events? He says, on Mount Sinai we were given the general rules, and on the Tent of Meetings we were given the details and the particulars. 
So this tells us something very, very solid, basic about Chochmah and Bina. Chochmah is about seeing the general picture. Chochmah, just like Mount Sinai is a mountain, it rises high, and when you stand above the mountain, you don't necessarily see the details. Sometimes if it's a very high mountain, it's above the clouds, you don't, you don't see the details at all. You just have a general understanding of things. You, you get the gist of things. Their spirit, their essence. Chochmah is about perceiving the essence of things. According to Rabbi Ishmael and according to the general characterization of, of Chochmah. There's something about the masculine approach to the world... Uh, not not to what today is is not how to necessarily today you would characterize men or women, but let's say traditionally and ideally, traditionally and ideally, masculinity is looking at the world from a higher perspective, and wishing it that it would be perfect. Like for example, delineating a utopia. Many men have written manifestos for utopias. And they were very good on paper. Not so good when implemented, but they were good on paper. Why? Because that's where men are good at. It's on paper. It's in theory. It's standing on top of some mountain and having this vision. So translating it into ground level and into how to go about it, that's a weaker point with men. But it's, but at least they have their good points, which is they can they know how to look at the world, they're also taller, it goes together, and they look at the world from, so to speak, from above, and they have visions of, of and general ideas, general philosophical, theological concepts about how the world should be. Or how the world is, but again, in philosophical, ideal terms. So Chochmah is something very broad, very general. It's also likened to a sight, to the, to the sense of sight. Why? Because when we see something, we see a whole picture. And we can see it in one instant, we can take in a lot of different details. We don't notice the details. So the best metaphor for this is when lightning strikes. Sometimes, many times, Chochmah is likened to a lightning bolt in your head. So when a lightning strikes in the world, and you get a glimpse, one instant, of an entire landscape, everything is lit up, you can see all the view, all the houses, but then it disappears. Do you remember all the details? Can you make a painting of it? You can't. But you did see, for one instant, a whole picture. When you start looking into the details, in many ways it's no longer eyesight. It's almost like listening to the picture. Why? Because going into the details is more like hearing, not seeing. Chochmah is about seeing the broad, general picture. So, Chochmah is general. Chochmah is like eyesight. Chochmah is, in many ways, above or outside time. Because in one moment, you can take in a lot of details. In one moment, it's like one eternal moment. And it's masculine. It's also a bit like the seed that the man plants in the woman. The seed contains many, many details, or the seed that you plant in the ground. It has all the DNA of the tree, but it's, uh, it's just in theory, it's just on paper, it's just information, it's not reality. Bina, which is here, here it corresponds to the Tent of Meetings, the second repetition of the Torah, which according to Rabbi Ishmael, that's where all the details come in for the first time. Bina goes into the details of the essential understanding of Chochmah. It starts breaking it up. That's like the seed of the father going into the womb of the mother, and within the womb of the mother, multiplying and differentiating. It multiplies and differentiates and integrates into a whole fetus, a whole organism. Bina is all about separating all the details, one from the other, and understanding the particular 
character of each element. That's differentiation. Bina, who was given Bina? It says that the rooster was given Bina to tell the difference between the day and the night. Hanoten lasechvi Bina lavchin ben yom uven laila. Even the word Bain, which means between something, Bain and Bain, is the root of Bina. Because Bina is the root Bin or Bain with the hey at the end. So Bina is all about differentiating and seeing the particular value and character characteristics of each element. So Bina is another the other is the second faculty of the intellect. And that's like the mother again. And it looks into the details. So you have you had a good idea. You had a, a, a lightning bolt of an idea. Something came in and you, you feel in your bones that something is very, very deep, very solid, very rich, is encapsulated in that vision. But now you need to take your time, just like pregnancy takes time, and understand what you perceived in the level of wisdom. So the first element is wisdom, that's when you grasp something very big in one instant, but you don't yet understand what you perceived. You do have wisdom, you have a bit of wisdom, a spark of wisdom. But when asked, do you understand what you saw or felt or experienced, then you say, not yet. Because now I have to work on my bina, my understanding. I have to start breaking it apart and thinking about it. This takes time. So, we said that Chochmah is characterized by, by being general and by being like eyesight and by uh, being outside of time in a way or be, being, you can perceive it instantaneously. So Bina is the opposite of all of this. It has to do with the details, not the general concepts. It's not like eyesight, it's more like hearing. Why? Because when you hear something, you don't perceive the entire symphony, let's say, in one moment. A painting you can take in in one moment. You see it. You, if, you, if you have a photographic memory, then it's already there. It's just one moment, and the entire picture is... But it, you can't do that with a symphony. Even if you spit it up on YouTube, you still need to go through all the notes over time. So listening is one note at a time. One word at a time, one letter at a time. When we read a book, although it's visual, we're not we're using the faculty of Bina of understanding, not the faculty of Chokhmah, because it's a linear process which is gradual. It's not simultaneous. It's over time. It's not synchronic, it's diachronic. It's one after the other. One letter in, we're listening to the text. We, we happen to be using our eyes, but that's not the main thing. We really, internally, we're using our, our mental ears, not our mental eyes. Because it's not a picture, it's text. It's like the author is speaking to us. So we're listening. It doesn't have to be your physical eyes or your physical ears. A book we read with our physical eyes, but we employ our mental ears. We're listening to the text. We're using Bina, not Chochmah. However, as... So, so all the differences are here. It's the details. It's one word at a time. It's more like listening. And it takes time. It's over time. Just like the man brings his own contribution to bringing a child to the world in one instant. But the woman, it takes nine months for her to give her part, to play her part in the bringing about of a new life into the world. And actually more than that, because then the breastfeeding begins. So it's a very long process. So this is just like wisdom can be instantaneous, just like the seed of the man, the father. But understanding is like a pregnancy. And like rearing the child, so it's longer. So you need to you grasp something, and then you need to understand it and go into the details. And indeed, that Mount Sinai was we said like a mountain, and then you go up and you view everything from above. 
the tabernacle and the house of the tent of meetings was situated on the ground. It's ground level. It's more grounded. And it has all the details. The way it's built, the measurements, and the sacrifices, and the service, and the different, and the inner altar, and the outer altar, and the different times, and different holidays. It's all very detailed. It's like Bina. So this is where Rabbi Ishmael said, we, on Mount Sinai, we just got the Ten Commandments, and then some more general rules, and now it's elaborated on on the, uh, the, the tent of meetings. Moshe is going into the tent and God is telling him the details. So it's a beautiful illustration of Chokhmah and Bina. And the way we described it so far, it's first Chokhmah and then Bina. We'll see in a minute, it can go the other direction also. Um, however, as I said before, Rabbi Akiva dif- is, uh, has a different uh, view of everything. And there's two things that he differs. He differs in mentioning a third incident, a third event, the third repetition of the Torah on Arvot Moav. And he also differentiates in that he inter-includes Mount Sinai with the Tent of Meetings. He says we got both the general rules and the particulars on both of them. And these two ideas, they really go together. So let's start with the inter-inclusion thing. Rabbi Akiva is thinking in inter-inclusion terms. The Book of Formation, Book of Yetzirah, presents this idea when he says the following. He says, one should always understand things with his wisdom and, let's say, think wisely about things with his power of understanding. This is a very lengthy translation for Haven Bechokhmah Vechachem Bevina. Understand within, it's inter inclusion, just like we have inter inclusion within the Sfirata Omer every day, that today is Yesod within Chesed, the foundation within loving kindness. So he entered the Book of Formation, inter included the first two Sefirot, Chokhmah and Bina. There's wisdom within understanding, and there's understanding within wisdom. So that means that even when you are on Mount Sinai, when it may, be, it may have been, my friend Rabbi Ishmael, it may be that you're right, that Mount Sinai was more wisdom-like. But surely, the details were somehow present there already. It cannot be that they came out of nowhere for the first time in the Tent of Meetings. They were there, a bit, maybe a bit like a recessive gene. They were there, but they were hidden, but they were there. And also, once you go to to the tent of meetings, and you go into the particulars, you don't lose sight of the general, broad concepts and ideas. So then, wisdom is inter-included within understanding. You need the broad picture. You need to see the whole picture, even as you're sinking into the details. And you go into all the details, you need to keep in mind what this is all about. And you can think about this, so he's he's an integrator. Rabbi Akiva is an integrator. He's telling you the following. He's telling you, when you have a vision for, let's say, a story, a work of art, a play, a, a, a vision of something you want to do in the world, you have a vision of what you want to change in the world, you don't have all the details, but you should know in many ways, don't worry, because the details are there in potentiality. You just have to actualize it. You have to unfold it. It's all there. Unfold it from there on. It's all there in the vision. If you have a vision, the details will come through unfolding. And then he gives another advice. Once it's all unfolded, and then you have trajectories and plans and details of how to do things, Always bear in mind the original vision that you have. You need both. They have to be inter-included. He's building up on his friend Rabbi Ishmael. He's not contradicting him, really. The contradiction comes, if you want to say exactly what happened there on Mount Sinai and the Tent of Meetings. But you can also say that Rabbi Akiva is just the next step. He's integrating the two. By the way, there's another beautiful argument between them, which again 
demonstrates their difference. <laughs> they argued uh, about what happened on Mount Sinai with the sounds and the images. It's very much connected to Chochmah and Binah, seeing and hearing. Rabbi Ishmael was very, he thought in, in regular terms, and he said, he, he said, the verse says, I remind you, the kol am ro'im et kolot, and the entire people, the entire people of Israel, would see the voices. They saw the voices. That's a, an explicit verse. <laughs> but Rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael says, no, no, no. What, what the Torah means to say is that they saw the visions and they heard the sounds. It doesn't make sense that they saw the, the, the sounds. What does it mean they saw the sounds? They saw the visions and they heard the sounds, but the Torah was short about it. The, the, the Torah was brief. He's differentiating listening from seeing. Chochmah and Binah. He's a differentiator. He's not an integrator. But Rabbi Akiva, but the same incident, he said, no, no, they heard the voices and they saw the... Vi- and, sorry. They saw the vision... Again. They saw the sounds and they heard the visions. He adds that. They didn't just see the sounds, which is a, an explicit verse, they also heard the visions, says Rabbi Akiva. Again, he's a, an integrator, an inter-includer, not a differentiator. Where does Rabbi Akiva get this power of inter-inclusion from? So this has to do with the other big difference between, the, between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, which is the mentioning of the third event. When Rabbi Akiva is mentioning the third event of the steps of Moab, really what he's adding to the picture is the third intellectual sefira, which is called Dat. Here we see that Dat doesn't... It, it, it's not as obvious as you would think. Before we have Chabad, Chochmah, Bina, and Dat, we just have Chochmah and Bina. It's a pair, and it seems like a perfect couple. Sometimes there are couples in the world that feel that they're, they're, they're so good for them, they don't need kids. Sometimes it happens. They say, we, we're so happy. Why do we need anything else? The equivalent of this in, the, in our own inner reality is that sometimes we have a lot of Chochmah and a lot of Bina. We see the big picture, and we see the small details. We see the vision, and we hear all the little notes and words, and, and there's a good relationship between the two. The mother and the father are happily married. So, but they're childless. And they're childless not just because they're barren or something, they're childless because we, again, it's all within us. It's our own Chochmah and Binah. We're, uh, we're using some sort of uh, psychological birth control. And what happens is, is that they don't give birth to emotional insights that go down from the head to the heart. It's all intellectual. It's just theories and ideas. It's very balanced, because it's not just Chochmah or just Bina, it's both. But it's all there in some philosophical realm and you you read about it and you talk about it and you philosophize about it and you see it from one perspective and from another perspective and you enjoy the arguments and you enjoy the the counter arguments and and it's all very beautiful but it doesn't change anything about your life it's almost like disembodied head that's floating above the you know a couple of meters above the ground when I was in the university, on my way to Tshuva, and thinking about the academic world, and all the students and the professors and everything we're doing here, at some point I had this vision, a very visual vision. It came from the Faculty of Wisdom, uh, which was, I looked, I was at the, at the, in the university, and I looked at all the people going to and fro from one class to the other, and suddenly I had this vision that all I'm seeing are floating heads without bodies, 
sort of bobbing around like uh, balloons. And they had no bodies. I could just picture it. I could just see it. Just bodies. Just say again, sorry, bodiless, sorry, disembodied heads. And I said, oh my God, this is what, what's happening here. It's not just a funny picture. It's really what's happening. And, and then I... And so I, at first I had the vision. That's like wisdom. And then you think about it. That's like understanding. You realize what it means. And you, you see how it plays about in all the lectures and all the books and everything. But then you need to, to rectify it. How do you connect the head with the body? You need the neck or the back of the neck, the spinal cord. You need something that connects the two. And this is that. This is knowledge. Knowledge means union, connection, bonding. Adam knew his wife Eve. As, as people say, carnal knowledge. It's not just carnal, it's carnal, it's emotional, it's spiritual. Knowledge means union, like an intimate union. So it's both the union of Chochmah and Binah, really, without birth control, really coming together in order to produce something. And also, it's the union of the intellect as a whole with the emotive sefirot, with going into, into feeling the emotional resonance of everything you're thinking about, letting it resonate, letting it sink in. Let your thoughts sink into your hearts. This is knowledge. So why is knowledge a bit of an outsider in the intellectual realm? Because knowledge in some ways is, is a visitor from the emotional realm into the intellectual realm. Knowledge isn't, isn't totally intellectual. An, an intellectual says, I don't need knowledge. Knowledge in the sense that we're talking about, the sphere of knowledge. I don't need to intimately know what I'm talking about. I need to just understand what I'm talking about. I don't need to have an experiential knowledge. I don't need to have intimate knowledge with something. I can talk about a professor of religion in the university. He says, I don't need to have a religious experience. I just need to talk about what religious people say and think and what the books say and what the history says. And... And... I, it's good. In fact, it's good that I'm detached. Because then I can be objective. And knowledge, the sphere of knowledge, is all about being subjective, not objective. It's an emotional, it's an emotional sefirah. It's the emotions within the intellect. This is the third element, the third thing. It's new. It's not the general, broad, you know, looking at things from above. And it's not going into the details in terms of understanding them. It's about somehow bonding with what you think about and being really connected to it and having an existential connection to what you're talking about. It touches you. It touches, it bears upon your life. It's, it's, it, it, everything you learn needs to bear upon your life. It needs to touch your heart in some way. Otherwise, you don't really learn it in, any, in, in a big way. It's just, it's just some, some idea, some theory. And what makes the, the repetition of the Torah and the steps of Moab, you know, demonstrative of this? There was Moses speaking in his own voice with his own words. It wasn't him just getting the hearing God on, the, on Mount Sinai, which was total selflessness on his part. Right, there's a gradual process. As, as we go from Chochmah to Binah to Dat, we get more room, and God get let, get, gets less room. On Chochmah, it's just God speaking, and, and you're just on the mountain, you don't feel yourself. You, 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 he fasted for 40 days. He, he, he had no experience of his own body. He was just hearing God's voice. Binah is when he's in the tent of meeting. A meeting is between two people. Binah is Bain le Bain, between. So on the, mount, on, on the tent of meetings, he, he, he was both God and Moshe together, meeting. And, and then from this meeting, from this sort of conversation, all the details be, be, became clearer and more, 
and, and were, were actually explained. But then, on the steps of Moab, God is, is taking a step backwards, and is allowing Moshe to retell the last 40 years in his own words. And he's in the background nodding. Nodding, yes, that's what I would have said. But I enjoy that Moses is saying this, and it's just my presence speaking through his throat. That's what he said about the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy. So, it's Moses in his own words. Why? Because it's that now. That is where you come into the picture. The subjective element, the human element. What does it say to you? What does it mean to you? How does it translate into your life? That's the third step of truly learning something. Truly thinking about something. It's first the broad outline and then the details. And then that is where it bears upon your life and and it goes into your heart and and finally into your actions. It has to translate into actions ultimately. This, by the way, has to do with Shemitah. Shemitah, the Sabbath, the sabbatical year, is letting go and letting things happen and, and being fully grounded. Letting, you integrate it so much that you, it flows through you, goes all the way through you until you live a life of Torah and commandments and you live it so much that it, it, then it comes out of you in translates into actual actions that you do and things that you say and then and then it takes a life of its own that's like Shemitah you let go of it you did the mitzvah you let go now it's part of the world you added something to the rectification of the world and now it's part of the world so Shemitah in Har Sinai is connecting Chokhmah with Malchut Malchut is the lowest of Sefirot that's Shemitah that's when you that's the bottom line of everything you did is you do something and you let it go. You release it. And there's a deep connection between the first element, which is the Har, the Mount, Mount Sinai, the first giving of the Torah in its broadest terms, and the final thing. So we, we managed to say something about Har and Shemitah. Now, just this process of Chochmah Binadat is also goes along with the, one of the uh, 13 rules of how to uh, sort of the 13 logical uh, tools or rules that we use in order to learn something from the Torah. Who said those 13 rules? It was Rabbi Ishmael that we have here. And one of the rules is klal uprat uklal. The general rule, the detail, the general rule. Whenever the Torah, and it happens several times, that the Torah is saying something very vague and general, then suddenly something very, very detailed, and then something, again, very general, sometimes in one verse. So he says, when this happens, then you should go with the details. You should The details tell you about how the general thing is conducted. But in Kabbalah, it's explained that it's referring this concept of klal prat klal, general rule particular, or universal particular universal, or general particular universal, is that it corresponds to Chochmah Bina and Dat. Chochmah is the general rule before the differentiation into details. Bina is the details. And Dat is when you go back to the big picture. Dat is the inter-inclusion of Chochmah and Bina. Putting it all together. It's, again, you go, ba- you go back to the general scheme, vision, idea, the dream that you had in the beginning. But now it's fully integrated with all the details. So the first klal is a pre-differentiated klal, and the second klal is a post-differentiated or integrated klal, general rule. So for Rabbi Ishmael himself, although he posited this rule, he didn't need to mention the steps of Moab. Because again, he's a differentiator. He, sets, he himself is a setter of rules. He sets out rules. So he just talked talked about the first two events. But Rabbi Akiva, was coming from below, had to mention the third one, uh, the third one as well. We should also add, and, and then we're, we're, we'll finish the class, although we have more things to say, but we'll finish it, 
is that these three elements, these three, these three stages, also correspond to a bigger three, which is the structure of um, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is made up of three parts. It's the Torah itself, and then the Nevi'im, the books of the prophets, and then the Ketuvim, the miscellaneous writings. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. And the explanation is that Torah is Mamesh Torah from heaven. It's totally God speaking. And then Nevi'im is, a, is all the prophets, what they said. All the prophets following Moses. And finally, the book of writings isn't prophetic. Right? The, the scrolls, the, the five scrolls, and, and the book of Chronicles. It's not prophecy. But it did come out of Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh is the, uh, so the direct translation, it sounds too Christian, is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit here means it's something a little bit akin to prophecy, but it's not prophecy. It means that it's our own way of, it's our own thinking, it's our own doing, it's our own writings. We wrote it. But it was governed from above. There was a, it was there was providence in the way it was written. That's why it came. It was put into the Tanakh. So you can see, beautiful. This is perfect. Chokhmah bina and that that the Torah, generally speaking, is chokhmah. It comes from above. It's universal. It's eternal. It's outside of time. The. Uh, the prophets, the book of the prophets are like Bina because it's prophecy reflected in the mind of the prophet. It's like a dialogue between the prophet and God and and also the Jewish people and God. That's what happens in the books of the prophets. It's all the history of the Jewish of the, the, the romance, the tumultuous romance between the Jewish people and God with all its ups and downs and uh, the infidelities and the returns and all of this. And this is Bina, it's like a dialogue between us and God, between the Prophet and God. And then finally, the books of the writings, it's like that. Because it's us writing it, but God agreeing and being, uh, and saying, yes, yes, you're that, that, that's how it's all integrated. That I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're integrating into your own writings. It's like the books of Solomon are there. And uh, and it's books of wisdom, of human wisdom. But it's it's through human wisdom also some of the word of God is revealed. So in a way, the three events of the giving of the Torah were sort of premonitions or an early iteration of a larger scale repetition of these three stages. Right? That Mount Sinai was like the Torah within the Torah. Right? All three events are in the Torah. But it's like the Tanakh, the Torah Nevi'im Ketuvim, the Torah Nevu'ah Ruach HaKodesh, within the Torah. It's all inside the Torah. So the, the Mount Sinai was the Torah within the Torah, and then the Tent of Meetings was the prophecy within the Torah, because it was Moses as a, as a regular prophet, not someone who's just totally self-nullifying himself. He was there talking to God and giving the prophecy. And finally, the book of Deuteronomy, which is just Moses speaking, it's, it's like a, an early appearance of the stage of the Ketuvim that's going to appear later on. So the structure of Chochmah bin Adat is very fundamental to understanding the structure of Tanakh. And it's reflected in a miniature version or in a smaller scale version within the Torah in the three events of the giving of the Torah. And we tried in this lesson to understand some basic things about the difference in the stages of how it works. That first we need to have a vision, and then we need to uh, understand the vision ourselves, which is breaking up into all of its various elements and parts, and, and understanding something from something else that is unfolding all of what's included in the vision. And this is all within us. This is why for Rabbi Ishmael, that's all he mentioned. But as we, if we want to be ba'alei tshuva and be practical about it and do something about it, we need to go to the third step, which is 
articulating it in our own words, in words that people can understand, regular words. This is like Moses speaking in regular human language on the steps of Moab. We have to be in, just as on, on the verge of going into Eretz Israel at the end of the 40 years. So this is the third stage of every intellectual cognitive process we need to go through. Sometimes we should say it goes the other way around. We start by articulating something we don't even understand yet, and then we start understanding and putting all the pieces together, and then suddenly we grasp the essence of it. So it, you can go either way. Rabbi Ishmael, by the way, is more of someone who goes from the top down. Rabbi Akiva is someone who goes more from the bottom up. So there was far more to say, but we, we, need, to, uh, uh, we need to stop here. So this is our class for Behar B'chokotai for this year. Hi, if you enjoyed this video, please press like and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon. Also, you're very much welcome to join our free weekly Zoom class once every Sunday. You can find the link in the description below. And until then, you can enjoy some more videos right now. Thank you.